ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय हेलो एंड वेलकम टू न्यू प्रोजेक्ट कैंप वीडियो So during the 2020 coronavirus lockdown, we got stuck in the mountains in southern India. And together with us, there was, of course, the, the owners, a few other guests, and a couple of Krishna monks that got stuck here uh, for, the, for the virus. And the more time we spent here, the closer we got to the Krishna consciousness uh, movement, religion, and lifestyle. So day after day, we've been spending more and more time with the monks to really understand their very particular lifestyle. And uh, because, you know, these people have been living for millennials together, combining the individuals and the group life in a, in a peaceful and full manner. And by now they have hundreds of temples all around the world. And I'm sure they know a thing or two about living together. First, a little bit of history here. So the Krishna movement officially became a society in 1966. It was founded by Swami Prabhupada, and it's got over a million devotees around the world by now. And it has uh, around about 850 temples spread across the planet. And of course, the majority of them are in India, but you can find a Krishna temple all around the planet. Uh, the Krishna consciousness is built upon Hinduism knowledge, which is up to 5,000 years old. Uh, but it got a huge revival when Swami Prabhupada traveled to the USA, where he found a very fertile ground in the hippie movement, because what they used to preach was singing, dancing, and eating and of course they aligns very well with the hippie sort of philosophy and in a matter of just a few years he managed to acquire millions and millions of new devotees and become hugely popular in the west so we're now going to go and have a chat with the monks to learn more about monastic life and get inspired for project camp all right before we dive into it a little disclaimer here the interview is pretty lengthy and it's got a monastic pace so grab yourself a drink sit comfortably and enjoy what a normal day looks like in a, in a temple. We worship the Lord along with the spiritual master. So we have deities of this in the temple. If those who have visited, they know. And in the morning, early, we have totally six aratis in the day. Arati is a way of offering in which different articles are offered uh, in a, with a specific Vedic uh, ritual. It is offered to the Lord. Worship time, 4.30 a.m. to... 6 a.m. including the chanting. Again, it is free from 6 to 6 a.m. to 7:30 a.m. Again, worship time, including Bhagavad Gita class, 7:30 a.m. to 9 a.m. Breakfast is breakfast is almost like free time. You chit chat and uh, you eat 9 to 10. 10 to 12:30, 10 a.m. to 12:30 p.m. If you are not engaged in any other, we call it as services. It's a free time. And 12.30 to 1.30, again it is puja time. 1.30 to 2 or 2.30, it is lunch time. Again, it's a free time. So from 2.30, you are let free till 4.30 p.m. And 4.30 to again 6.30, you have your Sandhya Harati and Tulsi puja. And 6.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m., you have your Bhagavad Gita class. From 7.30 p.m. to 8, you have your dinner. Again, from 8 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., you have closing, Saina Harati. So after 8.30 p.m., it's free time. You want to use sleep, otherwise you woke up whole night. Mm -hmm. So days in a temple are fully busy, with monks that are engaged both spiritually and physically the whole day. Next, how many monks live in a temple? That is no limit. It's, it's, it depends upon the building, what they have hired for the temple. It depends upon the space. It depends upon the financial incomes what the temple has. There is no limit. Basically, monk life is a life of dedication. Right? We are dedicated to the mission. We are dedicated to the propagation. Uh, uh, so, the, this kind of dedicated, which have in one temple, is in Mayapur. We have around 400 monks in one temple. 
around 200 in uh, that's Pune. So some big temples like that, they have around 400, 200. This is full time. Mm-hmm. And under them, there are many others who are uh, serving, learning, or new, new newcomers, or in between, all different types. How much free time and worship time is there in a temple? 99.99%. None of them are free in the temple because one has to go for book distribution, one has to go for helping in the kitchen, one has to go for helping for the Maharaj, one has to go for the administrative work, one has to go for preaching. So very less negligible chances I can say. You will hardly get 30 minutes to close your lids. Hmm. Yeah, that um, actually... There's no free time actually. <laughs> yeah. The whole idea of Krishna consciousness is that 24-7 you're supposed to be engaged in the service of Krishna. So there are two aspects. One is our own personal, you know, uh, uh, sadhana, it's called our own spiritual practice, plus the preaching and the service. In the temple services, it's right from the cleaning of the temple to the worship in the, you know, the deities. So everything, you know, it's, uh, it's all service for them. Uh, so if there are more devotees, then it's a little less physical work uh, because it can be shared. But in some smaller temples, then you have to do everything. All right, so there's very little free time in a temple. Lots of worship and service. Next, are there many visitors in a temple and how are they seen? In the temple, from Monday to Friday, we see around 500 visitors. But in Sunday, the 12.30 are the we have a system after Harati, even thousand people come, ten thousand people, visitors come, we provide lunch prashad. We respect the God to the peak. No doubt in that. Krishna is the ultimate. So whoever comes, he is also Krishna's devotee. And we take him, his care, not less than the people or the Prabhuji's or Mataji's who resides in the temple. So Krishna monks have tons of roles. Could you explain a few? First thing is you're not allowed to come with shoes inside. You're supposed to keep your shoes out of the uh, temple before you enter or any room for that matter. Mm-hmm. It's like you're sitting with your shoes. This is totally unacceptable. Okay. The closer you go to the Lord, the rules become more strict. If you're more a little farther away, then you're given a little more space. Mm. When you come close to the deities and with that, it becomes very heavy. Mm. Uh, it becomes very strict. You cannot, um, you know, yeah. Yeah, you cannot be lax with the rules. Uh, so, yeah, based on uh, the first, in the beginning, we don't stress too much the rules. We just stress on the chanting. You chant. But then when gradually a person becomes more serious, then there are more rules, especially in eating also, what uh, what can be offered to Krishna. There are many uh, rules. It, it seems external in the beginning, but there are both the external aspect and the internal aspect. The internal purification is the chanting, and the external is your cleanliness. Even when you sit in Bhagavatam class, by mistake, if your finger is falling into your mouth, just bow to the person who is sitting on Vyasasana, Go back to the wash basin and just wash your hand and come back. 99.99% or 100% it is a mode of cleanliness. Hmm. Shastra says be clean. Uh, You can't keep your finger in the nostrils and you cannot touch everywhere. It's a a point of cleanliness because Krishna taught how to be clean from heart bodily which in turn makes your soul be clean and cleansed from everything. All right, so tons of rules. But are these rules ever questioned? They did. The monks questioned a number of times. Why should I stick to the rules? And we explained them. It has been mentioned in the books what Krishna says, which we call it as Bhagavad Gita, the conversation between Krishna and Arjuna on the Kurukshetra battlefield. So, when scriptures are giving you, why you have doubt? Since we Google everything right now, we say Google is the best guru. People say that. So, when Google, which is created by a human, is the best guru, why can't your heart believe, which has been given some 5,000 years ago by Krishna, and which we still have it as Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavata? 
it is innocence. None disturbs you until you disturb others. This is a phrase for humanity. Tongue is a weapon. When it is used politely, the rest of the world is polite to you. When your tongue is used unpolitely, whom you blame? The basic qualification of someone who are in spiritual, even you are humiliated, your tongue should be polite. This is the difference between a spiritual man and a normal human being. And if you say, the rules makes us uncomfortable, that I want to sleep this time and I am forced to get up. I want to eat at that time which I am not supposed to eat or I didn't get my prashad. I clearly told you in the starting, when you want something, you should become that. There is no second thought or back step in that. You should know before jumping, I am jumping into the fire or I am jumping into the water. If you are a good swimmer, get jump into the water. If you are so powerful that your body is unburnt when you jump into the fire, jump into the fire. But don't jump into the fire and say it is burning. Choice is given. After jumping, if you cannot sustain, that is your problem. So with so many rules, is there freedom in a temple? Yeah, this is the ultimate freedom that, uh, you know, you are free from the uh, cycle of birth and death. And those who surrender to Krishna, Krishna assures that he frees them from the cycle of birth and death and we go back to the spiritual world. Right? And those people who in the material world, they think they are free, but actually they are bound by the laws of nature. So nobody is free in the material world unless he is surrendered to the Supreme Lord, uh, so Krishna. So this liberation is the real freedom. So we have to have a definition of what is freedom. Right? If you think uh, I'm free because I can go have uh, you know illicit uh, relationships with any woman I like, or you know, you think that is freedom. But that is a dog's or a monkey's freedom. You know, even monkeys are doing the same thing. So that kind of freedom is not real freedom. Right? For us, our definition of freedom, the Bhagavatam says, Muktir Hitvanyata Rupam Swarupena Vivastiti. Uh, real liberation means to be situated in your spiritual constitutional position and serve the Supreme Lord. This concept of political freedom or you know other types of freedom that uh, the scripture has, it doesn't give much value to that because it's illusory. Because you're not cross the modes of nature, you're not cross the laws of karma. You're bound by the laws of karma. So where is your freedom? There's no freedom. All right, we are almost half the way through the interview and I just found this beautiful footage from a Prabhuji singing. So I wanted to share this with you and uh, take a little break and then go back to the interview. What is the structure in the temple? I mean, what our spiritual teacher has given is that uh, there are three basic uh, posts in a temple. Uh, there is one is the temple president, and there is a temple secretary, and there is a treasurer. So these are three posts in uh, all the temples. Uh, and apart from that, uh, there are other devotees who are given specific tasks or specific uh, services, and they take the responsibility and they do those services. Uh, but as far as the official uh, hierarchy, I mean, these are the three top positions. And the guru? Uh -huh. And the spiritual master, he instructs, he's about them and he instructs uh, the, they are, generally they are disciples of the spiritual master. And is hierarchy seen as a problem or a necessity? No, of course it's a necessity, it's not a problem. It's a problem when the hierarchy is misused and that has happened and that's why people tend to take it as a, a, a problem. Okay, so a temple is a very structured and hierarchical society. Next, how are decisions made? By the temple president, with the consultation of the Maharaj, whoever who resides in the temple, they have a committee, advisory committee. They will have the meeting and they execute. And is that is that a smooth process or? 
comes with like hiccups and decisions problems. are smooth process implementing and getting implemented is tough process uh, decisions yeah that's that depends on surrender <laughs> because uh, if one is surrendered then he will accept uh, the decision made by his superior yeah it depends on what uh, ma the matter is uh, the issue in spiritual affairs uh, there is uh, guru sadhu and shastra like i said uh, which make the basic guide the basic uh, rules and you can't just whimsically make decisions there are so there's a guidelines for how to make decision what kind of this uh, what is the right decision was wrong but then when you know in the practical field there are on the what do you say on the job kind of decisions where you have to, you are doing some you have to just take a decision on it. so that uh, you have to depend on the whoever is your authority in charge and just decide but like if there's something really major a uh, decision then it goes up to the um, uh, the spiritual master and, uh, are there conflicts between the monks when they're living together there will always be some uh, agreement disagreement so it depends on the maturity and if you have uh, you know and respect if you respect the other person then even though you may see some you know faults there then you are able to tolerate it tolerance is one of the main principles of spiritual life the first principle mm -hmm. so basically you are seeing some shortcomings in the other person who you are living with and you have to share the same space you know the small an ashram you have to share with so many people uh, you know the common everything is common you know so all these there there is some types of clash in this and that but yeah if you are mature and if you have a goal in mind and tolerance you are to tolerate some inconveniences you neglect all the you know difficulties that may come you tolerate it. okay so tolerance is key to live together but when there are problems is there a special recipe for conflict resolution whatever issue they get when you smile and solve mountains can be broken to mountains can be joined and are monks ever kicked out yeah it's basically two things money and women that's yeah. <laughs> keep it simple so sometimes the monks they get attracted by some beautiful woman or something so they want to get married so they have to leave uh, or money sometimes even in spite of women and money they want to stay and they're not allowed they have to forcibly kicked out right or if they do some really bad thing which is some abominable activity it's like uh, in our delhi ashram one you know russian monk there was a russian monk he went crazy and he started dancing naked in the guest house right so he was kicked out how does a temple make money our official two uh, source of income is uh, our book sales and our uh, and donations because monk life is simple two times food or one time food or three times food based upon his body level and accommodation is already available the the, the uh, clothes what the what they wear uh, they will have two sets or three sets max right? maximum three sets that's it so lifestyle is very simple how do you spend the money is a uh, for it... two things again printing the books and for construction and maintenance of the temples and ashrams and what about the monks do they get like pocket money or say you need to go and visit your family or you have a problem you need to go to the hospital how does that work yeah house yeah there's nothing like a specific fund as such but uh, generally some uh, the temple will take care of these things like uh, if it's reasonable unless it's unreasonable something reasonable the temple will take care that's not an issue money uh, because krishna is the husband of the goddess of fortune right so when you worship krishna then money is generally not a problem what are the biggest challenges of living in a monastery every day it is a challenge yeah basically no privacy that's one of the things you don't have any, generally everybody likes some privacy but then you have to give up privacy when you're living together mm -hmm. and uh, you have to take other people's problems right uh, you don't have that problem but he has a problem uh, and you have to deal with that right i don't want to deal with it but i have to deal with it because i'm living with them i'm staying at so like that and of course uh, yeah when the desires the material desires come then we should not get washed away or blown away by these material desires yeah, and another thing is social criticism and so many things 
generally when we uh, give up family life and we don't follow family life, we get a lot of criticism from society. Yeah. You woke up in the morning and you say, I am so calm, so peaceful. But what about the people in around? Are they in the same platform? You are to your conscious between the four walls. When we step out the foot for the artists, we have to encounter the things happen around us, among the devotees who live in the temple, the visitors who come. They rush to us to ask questions because they need answers. Who is there to answer in their family? These answers only a man who is connected to the spirituality can answer. And we have to withstand with their questions. Either it is silly, we have to answer in the smiley way. Either it is hurting in the same smiley way. Either it is burning in the same smiley way externally. But what happens to internal? We get little anger. And we have to say, hmm, it is a challenge every second. What would you say is the relationship of Krishna consciousness with uh, sustainability? Yeah, the fact that Krishna consciousness is sustained for million, millenniums itself, it's, it's a proof that it's sustainable. It's, if you're not able to sustain, means you're not applying the principles properly. The basic principle is you, you, uh, you produce what you need. And you use only what you produce, right? This is the basic principle of sustainability. What would be your number one tip for a bunch of people that are, that are about to start the community? Community-wise, if you have to get together, you have to have common principles, like which is standard for all, which everyone must accept. Any community to stay together, they have to have a common holding principle, right? So if, they, if that holding principle is there, it's like for us, Krishna, worship of Krishna. In a temple, everyone gathers to worship Krishna. So the common principle of Krishna worship is there. So that's what is joining the whole community. Maybe they are of different backgrounds or so many different things. So the common principle has to be there. And one thing, another thing is eating together. Like in our temples, all, when it's eating time, you may not know where the monks are. And, but at the time of eating, you will find all of that. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you. First, they have to monitor are they happy internally, individually, before joining a group? Are they eligible to respect them first and the next heart? Are they comfortable with the other's freedom or they are comfortable? to their freedom. Once for all, they themselves have self-assessment and anal analysis, they can join a group. When you go to the crowd, two tongues, three tongues, five tongues, six tongues, they won't keep quiet. They will blabber. Are you eligible to withstand with that blabber? Are you capable? to revert what that tongue is blabbering without hurting, even if you are getting hurted, then you are a winner. When other tongue is cutting your thoughts and you feel it is high time, how long you will live together? But when you go to a group, when you start living, what is your motto? Only that group will form some rules and you live and you will die, is it? How this group motivations, how this group plans, how this group activities is helping the nation. That comes into the picture. If you are not helping the nation, what is the value of your existence? No, I am happy. My group, I am happy. My group is happy. We live, we eat, we, we exist, we disappear. Like that, how many groups have disappeared? Who knows? What is the use when you don't mark your name in the history where you have stepped on? What is the use? So mark your name in the history before your soul leaves your body. So that the rest of the humanity, human existence speaks about you and the work you have done. That is the ultimate motto and motive.
Thank you. All right, I hope you guys got inspired by this monastic lifestyle. It is definitely something very foreign to us, very, very far away from what we are used to. Uh, and it's a very hardcore, quite intensive way of living. However, I hope that there are a few elements here and there that you can uh, adopt and implement in your own lives and projects. A few takeaways from these interviews. One, living together is challenging. Even monks that live together all of their lives and really spend their lives to understand the human conditions, they are faced on a daily basis with very similar challenges to the one that us normal people have. Second, having a purpose is absolutely crucial. Having shared values and goals really helps to glue a community together. And, and it's kind of a tool to help um, overcome issues and problems as well as making decisions. And third, this is a very structured society. Monks living in temples, they have tons of rules, very set roles and hierarchies that have, have helped them to grow and expand over the centuries. All right, that's it with this video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next Project Camp video. Au revoir. <laughs> <laughs>